five, four, three, two, one. The Sofa Club is live. Hello, and uh, welcome to the Piccadilly Sofa Club. Tonight, um, it was supposed to be Rowan from the Queer Music Movie Podcast, but unfortunately she's unwell, so um, you've got me instead. I'm Tom Abel, and I'm the founder of Piccadilly Pictures. And tonight we have a really gorgeous, heartwarming, really lovely film, um, beautiful comedy called Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf, directed by the wonderful Anna Margarita Albeo, who will be joining us tonight, along with her co-star of the film, the absolutely gorgeous Gwyneth Turner. So um, please say hello. 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 Hola. <laughs> and um, before we start, just wish Anna a very, very happy birthday, which is tomorrow. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Corona. I'll take the hat off now. So for starters, <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about yourselves. I mean, we'll start with Anna. Um, just a bit of background to everybody about yourself, how you got interested in this dreadful film business and um yeah how's life thank you i'm so excited thank you for having us thank you for featuring who's afraid of vagina wolf a true labor of love and um and psychic confusion uh and so i'm in miami i grew up in miami and went to film school uh, in florida state university but i was always taking french uh as a passion and so when I uh, graduated from, French, from film school, I decided to move to Paris and make my filmmaking career uh, in, in France. So I wanted to make a career that was not American, big budget, commercial films. I wanted to uh, use filmmaking um, as kind of, a, a, of activism. And I loved like uh, experimental film and video art and stuff like that. I, I started in making videos when I was 15, back in the 80s when the camera was a VHS camera that, you know, weighed, you know, 15 pounds. Um, and so I stayed in Paris and that's where I started my career the first 15 years. But uh, I wanted to make a feature film that I started working more and more in auto fiction, as uh, I was calling it, as I, as I call it still, uh, you know, using um, inspiration from my own life, especially as a lesbian, as a Latina, uh, as a Cuban, uh, as an 80s child, uh, Generation Xer, uh, to, you know, use my experience, but also, you know, in relationship to what am I learning, what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the, in the history, and then use a lot of comedy, use a lot of, I'm a cinephile, I love film, I always try to reference a lot of films in, in my storytelling, and, uh, and so uh, I actually came back to America to make another film, which was my, supposed to be my first film, which is based on my life when I was 15, growing up in Miami in the 80s, in the time of Scarface and, uh, you know, the Mario Boat Lift and, you know, pop culture. Uh, but it didn't go through. So I ended up saying, you know, uh, independent film and micro budget and crowdfunding. This was in 2011, 2012. I said, people are making their own films if they can muster up enough you know, friends and crew and a little bit of cash, uh, you can make a film. So I decided to tell the story of where I was at, more or less. It's a, a, a bit of a hybrid of, you know, fiction and, uh, and fantasy, like, like myself. And, uh, and so pulled it together to, to make Vagina Wolf. And it was a multifaceted story of getting the money and the crew and, you know, a lot of, you know, there's over 400 people in the, in the credits uh, that are, you know, responsible along with me to bring this movie uh, to everyone. And Guinevere, um, how did you, I mean, I first met you in Berlin in the early 90s with, um, oh, wow. with yes. Rose. Um, in the, we were staying in the same hotel with um, Go Fish when it premiered in Berlin. Mm, which would have been 94. Very, very long ago. Yes. Uh, so oh. I did not study film or not even film theory, and did not go to film school. Uh, I, I came into the film world in a, out of a 
um, my girlfriend at the time was uh, in 1990 was Rose Troche and she just graduated from film school and we just started saying there's no lesbian films that we feel like represent us you know it's always one tortured woman or one coming out story or you know you know just there's a lot of we, we never see just like a community and you know just kind of a day in the life of kind of you know with the regular old you know breakup dramas and jobs and issues with their parents and you know hanging out and drinking games and you know everybody having sex with everybody and you know just like the lesbian <laughs> culture that we knew we had never seen and so I was like I was like, I had studied fiction writing in college and I was like, well, how hard can it be to write a screenplay? You know, people like walk into a room and they say stuff and they walk out. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than that I've learned. Um, but it is a very chatty film because that's that was me. And I had never even read a screenplay when I wrote that screenplay. Um, so uh, so it, it is, thank God there's sex scenes and, and that... Um, <laughs> That rose that came coming from film school has all these sort of gorgeous, it's, you know, shot in black and white and has all these gorgeous kind of interstitial things that make it feel cinematic. Because I didn't know anything about that. And I would be like, why are you shooting that milk going into that coffee? That iced coffee, like, what does that have to do with anything? She's like, wait for it. And I was like, oh, I get it. You can't just be talking nonstop for an entire movie. <laughs> right. Uh, so because of that film, Go Fish, which went to Sundance and Berlin won the Teddy at Berlin, um, all of a sudden I was an actor, which I also didn't study to be. Uh, and I was and a screenwriter, and so I was getting offers and jobs, and all of a sudden it was the 90s, and I was in every every other independent lesbian film, <laughs> and I uh, met Mary Heron, who I then went on to do American Psycho, The Notorious Betty Page, and most recently a film called Charlie Says. And um, and then, there you have it. Ta-da! I'm a Hollywood screenwriter. And I, and I also teach screenwriting at the graduate level, and I, I, I knew when I first started doing it about five years ago, I said... You know, I never went to film school and I never, you know, I, I here I am, but I didn't, you know, I did, certainly didn't go to grad school. Then I'm like, mm, you don't really want to tell people who are paying $100,000 a year <laughs> for an education that I didn't need it. <laughs> so I stopped saying it twice. So yeah, so here I am. I have another film with my frequent collaborator, Mary Heron, uh, ready to go. We just need money if anyone has any. Um, and uh, I'm also putting together a film that I wrote with a different director uh, for me to star in as a crazy lady, which I'm really looking forward to. And we're, and it, what another interesting topic to talk about is how we're, how we'd make independent films now in the age of COVID, uh, which is something I've been thinking a lot about and uh, is a, another topic. Anyway, that's my story in a nutshell. Uh, you so, forgot our current project, Claire at 16. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm mad at them because I haven't signed my contract yet. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not promoting them until they freaking give me a contract. Like, <laughs> no, we had, so I, I, um, doing a rewrite job and Anna is directing a film about a teenage serial killer girl. Yeah. We can go on to that a little bit later on, but um, I mean, how did you come together for Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf? How well, I just want to interject one thing about Guinevere's uh, his, uh, cinema history is that I was living in, pa I moved to Paris in 93 and in 1995, Go Fish came to the uh, Paris Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. And I went with all my friends and I had been doing a lot of like video shorts and spoofs and parodies and art films. But when we came out of Go Fish, I was like, I have to make a movie. And so I made my first, like five months later, I was shooting my first short film that's called Coco uh, that I redid uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless in 15 minutes, you know, very ambitious. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, it was coming out of, you know, seeing Go Fish, like I definitely was, one of the you know lesbians in the audience that was like we can tell our stories and and you know like she said like a slice of life of a group of friends and that's something that's always stayed in my mind i've always gone to gay and lesbian film festivals starting in college they were small and they were all very experimental and everything was really vhs but you know it's it's my the last 30 years i've been dedicated and always put my films in lgbt festivals go attend them discover stuff Peccadillo, you know, Wolf Video, just really trying to um, see as much as possible uh, because I know how inspiring it could be for us to n not necessarily just see ourselves, but just see other, you know, uh, people doing and other women and lesbians just, you know, showing their lives and, and showing their opinions on life, showing their, you know, creativity about life. 
Yeah. Tell the story of how we met, though. It's a very lesbianic story. <laughs> so uh, this is very lesbianic. So, of course, I was, uh, you know, um, so in France, I started uh, doing documentaries for Canal Plus, which is like a HBO or a French, you know, BBC, I, I guess BBC, I'm not sure. But anyway, so, uh, and I would always pitch uh, lesbian documentaries to try to get lesbians in the mainstream media. And so my second documentary was on the Dinosaur Weekend. It was like it was like a big anniversary, I think, and you know it was. Uh, wait, it was you should explain to the people in, if they don't know internationally what uh, the, what the Dinosaur Weekend is. Oh yeah, that okay. So yeah, I just always call it Lesbian it's, Spring Break in, in the U.S. It's Lesbian <laughs> Spring Break. It's just like the biggest <laughs> lesbian party that goes on for what, like three, four days. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think it's like a week now, uh, up to up to now, I guess, with Corona it canceled this year, but. Yeah, it's, I think it started in the 90s, it happens in Palm Springs, and it really is, you know, the year that I went, they were estimated about 13 to 14,000 women, uh, and there was Joan, jo and, you know, and it, so it's like music, and they take over whole hotels, and it's just a lesbian jamboree, and you see <laughs> all types of lesbians. It had, in the 90s, it was, you know, it was connotated as like a, like a California lesbian party, so it was more like the lipstick lesbian, as we called, or like, you know, the blonde hair, women, lesbians with jobs, and that it would be kind of the same kind of demographic. But so when I went, you know, it was really my documentary was like the who, what, where and how. And I saw that it actually attracted all types of women from all over the world, all class, all diverse backgrounds. And Guinevere was there uh, attending to uh, to speak, I think, on a, on a panel. And uh, so we, we, I was doing stuff with the L word, I think. Yes, exactly. Just an and extra les, another les layer. <laughs> Jane and Alice. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the Pussycat Dolls were there. Th that was another thing that was kind of spectacular was that, you know, no normally before lesbian events just, you know, didn't have any stars. It didn't have, you know, a lot of money. And it's kind of still the same, unfortunately, you know, 25 years later. But, um, yeah, so Guinevere, I, I, I had asked to interview. So we actually met on camera. <clears throat> and uh, and so you know and by this time already I had I was I knew everything about her career and also the L word and all this kind of important like lesbian culture uh, uh, making that that she did so we met officially on camera and the the documentary is called the Les in Wonderland it's amazing it's uh, I have it online now on, on YouTube for free uh, and you'll learn a lot but so and from then on we became great friends it was in April. Coincidentally, two months later, she was coming to Paris to meet with Rose to work in Paris and, you know, to do their thing. And so we reconnected again and it kind of like solidified our friendship. Uh, a few years, uh, like a, two years later, I moved back to the States from my film and uh, I ended up looking for a place in Los Angeles and Guinevere had a spare room. And she said, oh, you could stay with me for like two months, one or two months to like, you know, get you on your feet. I don't like living with people. And I ended up staying 12 months a year, <laughs> and it was amazing. <laughs> and we both were writing and both working from home, and uh, and uh, you know, and that was the thing. Like Guinevere, even till today, like with this other project, uh, you know, I aside from being friends, you know, I, I admire her immensely for her convictions and her you know dedication to lesbian culture, but also her talent as a screenwriter, and uh, you know, especially in these today and these last few years the need for diversity and the need to have like writers and and diverse writers that understand uh you know different people's voices and um so yeah so it was great and we've been we've did i worked on who you know the owls and and that guinevere was a part of <clears throat> and i did a whole documentary following the 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 owls called hooters which peccadillo offers with the owls as a double feature dvd blu-ray um, so it's just, you know, it's a long time friendship. My family loves her. My mother's obsessed with her. She buys her gifts and, you know, <laughs> here's to 50 more years. Oh, that's wonderful. So, uh, so when you started the writing the script for, um, for Joanna Wolf, were you living with Guinevere at the time? Uh, no, I, I wasn't living with Guinevere anymore, but, uh, you know, we were definitely, I was in Los Angeles and we were definitely doing a lot together. The, I'm not a screenwriter at all uh, by training, but I had always written, you know, I envisioned my films and then I would write them on paper so that my collaborators could, could see. There were shorts or my documentary, you know, a lot happens on the field and then a lot of writing happens after. But with uh, Vagina Wolf, I just, 
I wrote like what I call I would call a scriptment, and uh, but I had always like the role of Penelope of that Guinevere portrays was written for Guinevere, uh, you know, and she was and we had we shared a love of, also of old Hollywood, of Elizabeth Taylor and and these uh, kind of actors of Who's Afraid of uh, Virginia Woolf the original film and the play, um, and so uh, I definitely had her in, in mind for that. I wrote a scriptment out, which was like, you know, kind of, you could read the whole story of it and approach Michael Urban, who's actually the screenwriter of Saved uh, with Macaulay Coughlin and Mandy Moore. Do you remember from the 2000s? Uh, about, uh, they're in a Catholic school girl. And so we've been friends since college, since I was 19. So Michael joined to write the script and actually Guinevere came in, uh, you know, several times to help form the script. Something that was, you know, there was a lot of fantasy. I wanted it to be a musical originally, uh, but, uh, you know, I started off with my crowdfunding. I had $360 in my bank account. So it was like, <laughs> let's see what, where we could go. And, uh, and so what we ended up... a musical, Jeez, I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have been able to do it because I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I could sing, but I'm not well, like I'm not musical. Either, right? but I wanted, I wanted, you know... We would have auto-tuned, and it was really about the fantasy. <laughs> uh, what did you think when you when 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 the scriptment was first given to you? Did you? Oh, I was super excited. I had so much fun playing this character. I mean, when you're playing an actor who's playing the character that Elizabeth Taylor plays in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, that's just hog heaven. Do you know what I mean? And 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 to me, there's kind of like. In certain parts of the performance, like you can't go wrong. All you have to do, nothing is too big, um, and that's just not. That's very rarely true in an acting experience. Uh, so I was just super excited and couldn't wait to actually get in the skin, especially doing the film within the film and being in in Liz Taylor drag and doing the Liz Taylor dance and all of that. It was just super fun. And I and I, Carrie Preston, who plays our third friend. Um, uh, who's you know famous here for being a True Blood and um, The Good Wife and um, she has her own show. And she's, a filmmaker. And she's her own also filmmaker. filmmaker. Right. She's also a director. And she you know she certainly didn't need to come on board our scrappy little film. You know certainly not for her career, but she you know is a director herself. And uh, I I had just become friends with her, and she so she signed on, and you know she's just so. Um, delightful and hilarious and singular. I mean, I just love her in this movie too. Yeah, I think that was the beauty of, you know, especially back then, it was like the beginnings of, you know, the the crowdfunding and micro budget, like, you know, it, like the micro budget was maybe that called the independent film in the 90s, but, you know, by the mid or late 90s, you know, even independent film, if you didn't have, you know, Matt Damon, I mean, uh, Matt Dillon or Gwyneth Turner in your film, you weren't gonna get any financing. But uh, so it was great because it, it, it's especially living in Los Angeles, you get to know a lot of different people. So we got Janina Gavankar, who is a poppy in the L word, uh, you know, and she plays uh, Katya, my love interest. Um, and uh, we just, you know, the, 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 a friend's house that I actually house sat at, I actually lived in people's garages. You know, they lent me their house, they became our studio. Uh, we got, you know, incredible, like people, just donated for like the art, de you know, art department and our costume designer was fantastic. Like she made me cry when she came out with Guinevere's Elizabeth Taylor look, the bustier and I, I started crying. Like, it, you know, and she had like $50 to work with to, to dress everybody. No, you know? it was wonderfully so, done, that was the whole thing. It was, uh, yeah, it was magical. Uh, and you know, and it was a good chance because the play Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf it, like whenever said, and Elizabeth Taylor is so dramatic and over the top and like sloppy. And, and I was like, this is a good match for like how lesbian drama can get very messy and <laughs> and, and speechy and complicated. And the night lasts forever. You know? <laughs> After the club, back at the house, it's just like, okay. So, one, of the, um, one of the things I, I was very excited at first because I, I asked Anna, I'm like, can I, when I get really mad, can I just pull off my wig and throw it on the ground? Because I just have always wanted to do that. And boy, and she was like, yeah, go for it. But wow, I, don't, be careful what you wish for. 
It, you <laughs> pulling off your wig for, for 20 takes and then having it pinned back on your head oh, is oh. no fun. I was like, what? Whose idea was this? I'm like, I did this to myself. <laughs> but, you know, it's just such a like fun drag queenish moment to be like, you disgust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The casting yeah. was wonderful. So it, it was just generally just very organic bringing in the in, in, in the cast. Yeah, yeah we didn't I mean, not luckily. At all, right? No, no. And and even, you know, uh, most of the time, I think casting director is probably one of the positions in film that I've worked with the least. Uh, again, you know, the, the first and foremost, like a lot of before Vagina Wolf, like my other fictions, the people I know in my life inspire me a lot, and sometimes I'm just like, you, you know, could you want to play? And and, uh, but at the same time, living in Los Angeles, actually, you start just having people in your life that are amazing actors. And normally, if you're, you know, like we're we're activists and we talk a lot about feminism and and LGBT rights and stuff like that, and so you kind of attract interesting people that you know want to get involved and. A lot of times for film budding filmmakers or filmmakers who want to do stuff is like a lot of actors and stuff make a lot of money doing the big stuff and they oftentimes crave and want like a group of friends making a movie uh, or, a, you know, a, a, a community that's make telling a unique story, you know. Uh, so like I, I definitely like I say a lot of people say this for their first film. If I knew what I knew now. But honestly, having the naivete and pure optimism and energy to just, you know, and I'm talking about the actors, but I'm also talking about equipment, getting incredible deals or things for free and, and people to work for, you know, a, a song and some chili. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really invigorating, you know, to, uh, to, well, that, to work that, that way. That kind of brings me to one of the, the first questions that we have in from the audience, actually. And this is from Bex. Uh, and the question is, um, any advice for anyone who isn't male trying to get a lesbian film project off the ground? Is <laughs> DIY the only way forward? So anyone who isn't male making a lesbian project? Yeah, uh, here's the thing. Honestly, we're again, and this has been m many times in the last like 30 years that that we seem to be in a position where in general, the industry is like, we want to hear diverse story, you know, voices. Like it happened in the 90s for each group. Oh, we want black film. Oh, we want Dance black picture, music. Mike. Oh, um, oh yeah. sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah, my thing fell. Uh, I was saying, you know, in the last 30 years, it's a lot. It's happened that the official industry or the, the l'air du temps says, oh, we want diverse voices again. But the reality is, you know, uh, financing is still very old school. And so, you know, for lesbian films, you know, it's really one of the best ways to do it that is not DIY is by getting the actors, you know, getting actors that, especially if you want to direct, because I would say, or, or if you want to act or you're a screenwriter, try to find, you know, uh, some established director or some, but now I hear that a lot of like good companies and independent film companies and even you know mainstream companies are looking for and soliciting for more diverse screenplays, and the door is opening wider for uh, first time or you know non-traditional commercial filmmakers to get a chance. You know, and for them, you know, a million dollar, two million dollars is not a big deal to give someone a first film. Where for us, it's huge. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of ways to get to your first feature film and depending on, you know, how you want to get financing, uh, definitely the, the shorts are back, like making a good short uh, and the good comes from what you're saying and the heart that with, with which you're saying it more even than technology, because actually technology looks amazing. Like, look, this is my, look, this is the filter from Skype and I look great. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you know, um, having something to show people five years ago, like shorts were over, nobody wanted to see it, every, you couldn't sell it, you know, it's it's uh, it was complicated. But now you can, and people will watch them. And and I and I I want to just say that I will motivate everyone to follow what Bell Hooks, the feminist uh, black 
lesbian philosopher says, if you want to be pertinent, you have to always keep moving from the, the mainstream to the margin and margin and back, moving back and forth. If you stay only marginal and in the underground, then you're, you're in that world, but you're not being pertinent. And to change, we have to get into the mainstream, get that, the money and the budget we deserve, and start educating the masses with our brilliance and our culture and our comedy. Um, you know, and that's how it's going to keep, the door's going to keep opening for everyone to have a shot. Guinevere, any thoughts on that from, from your perspective? Um, definitely agree that pulling together what, however you can to make a short film is, is a very wise way, is a very uh, wise step to, toward getting a feature made. Um, because you know, people just want to see your style and your voice, and it and it shouldn't be that hard. I I tend to, I've made like I've written and directed five or six or seven shorts, and I still can't get anyone to let me direct a feature. But I have learned a lot, and I'm getting better, and I'm making lesbian culture. I oh, what, just a quick plug. Starting on Sunday on uh, a platform called Tello, uh, one of the my most recent short film that I wrote and directed will be available to watch. Oh, oh which one? It's called post. You know it. Uh, it's called post apocalyptic potluck. Um, oh wow! And it's, and it's about three friends on. who are, you know, twenty <laughs> minutes after the apocalypse are just like stuck at a brunch. Um, uh, and it's it feels weirdly timely now. I made it yeah. two, two two years ago, three years ago. Which brings us to another question. Um, this is from Milton Diaz, um, and they ask, what kind of pictures is appropriate to do in Hollywood now? knowing about the pandemic. And this is from uh, a question from Nicaragua, actually. Oh, hola, como esta? Milton, but uh, appropriate? Meaning, yeah, what is, to make in now. what sense? Like, what, uh, films would be appropriate to make now um, in Hollywood, knowing about the, the current pandemic? Well, they, we're, it's, everyone's still figuring it out. Um, but, you know, the project that we're doing together, for example, they're just, They've, I'm, you know, I'm doing this rewrite and they're saying, please, you know, try not to have big scenes with a lot of people, which is hard because it's a high school movie. Um, uh, and so it's really about, you know, as few characters as possible, uh, you know, no, no crowd scenes, you know, bar scenes. I mean, the, the protocols are, are simply, you know, they're obviously different for actors than they are for crew and everyone's figuring it out. And aside from one soap opera here that went it back into production um, last week, uh, no one's quite figured it out. No one's, or no one's put it to the test. Um, although I think a lot of people are, we, we know certainly our production is is trying to figure it out. So I mean, I I, I have been struggling with the idea of moving forward. Our audience is going to want to see things that reflect this this time and this crisis, or are they going to want something that like how do you do you leap over it and pretend it never happened? You know, in in, in film and television. Are we going to be like, please? I don't want to watch anything about it. I just went, I just lived through it, or am still living through it. Uh, so that's a big question that I've been, uh, and, and especially medical dramas have been struggling with, which I just mm -hmm. think is interesting. So it, it, the, 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 that was a long answer, but the, I think the answer is that everyone's still figuring it out and um, hoping that it'll go away, so we don't have to incorporate it permanently into how we make films. Yeah, yeah. I understand that the BBC. Uh, with some of their um, larger productions, they're actually putting the whole cast and crew into quarantine. Right, that's what we, we're definitely going to do that. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say something else about just the uh, conceptualizing films for the next year, let's say, you know, until there's a vaccine or whatever. That is, you know, I, I lived in France for 15 years. There's a lot of French films and a lot of like international films that are much more intimate, that are you know, less people, less song and dance and pizzazz and locations and this. It's a lot more about human relationships, about relationships to the characters, to themselves. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, not having sex scenes, not having kissing scenes, which I never really have. You know, I think I had two kisses in my film. Uh, having, and I think that makes us look into much more about the interpersonal relationships within the characters and stuff that is, a lot more focused and a lot more intimate, you know, so maybe it's a time to spend, you know, thinking about those types of um, storytelling, uh, more slice of life, more, um, you know, uh, and also very inventive, you know, uh, there's a series that I love in, in America called One Day at a Time about a Cuban family in, uh, in LA 
and they shot half their season that was airing and then they were going to shoot the next half and you know and the corona landed in the middle so i just their last episode was animated so they did the whole you know and i love animation there's some animation in vagina wolf some stop motion you know collage uh they did it animated you know there's a lot of different we we're so lucky to have a, a richness of like technology at our disposal and the price has come down for everything and also a lot of people aren't working and a lot of people you know can are available and might be more interested in working on something uh right now because of the pandemic and doing stuff remotely uh so you know there's you know safety is number one. like you don't want anyone to uh you don't want to put anyone in jeopardy but uh i think that there's a lot of stuff to do with uh being more intimate and uh and finding more like various ways of telling your story um a question from jasmine are there any queer films or filmmakers you feel should be on the audience's radar i definitely madeline olnick uh oh, I, I love I, madeline. I, yeah i just produced her film uh, the wild night with emily an incredible first of all it's a period piece about the american poet emily dickinson that everybody said was a spinster loner recluse in her room but she wrote these incredible poems about love and it was like how does she magically know how to write about love if she was always in a room you know and of course and madeline did incredible research she her first two films which you haven't seen i'm going to put on your radar uh, uh codependent lesbian space alien seeks uh, other and which, the Foxy we, uh, which we distribute oh, okay. yeah i love that one yeah. and uh, foxy merkins and she has some shorts as well uh, and and now uh, one night with emily which is i think it's a picadillo and uh you know she's she's smart she has a unique sense of comedy and and her actor like the the universe she creates her casting is incredible and she's also a very committed lesbian filmmaker she's an activist she gets involved you know so i really like admire you know what she does um Actually, I would also like to put um Jenny Olsen on people's radar that a lot of people don't know her work. She's she does a really interesting kind of hybrid documentary personal stories with just like beautiful unique stuff. Uh it's Jenny with an I and I'm sure if you just google her you can get to her website and see where to watch her films. She has a film called The Royal Road that I think it just came out on maybe the Criterion platform. Uh and there it's just that she's very uh there's she's one of a kind in her style and and her her it's like she invented her own genre yeah and and it's, and it's really cool and then you know there's a lot of lesbians from the lesbian filmmaking canon that are finally making uh film bigger you know bigger films like Nisha Ganatra uh she just did something with Tracy Ellis Ross uh Laura Teruso who's great uh, you know so uh but their work is not uh ref- reflecting lesbian characters and stories right now that these work but they they have done so much in lesbian film and lesbian storytelling so it's also good to be aware who's you know who's uh, who can we continue to support because when they get to a point that they're that they can make uh, you know a lesbian film their success will it will help them make a lesbian film like Celine Sciamma in France you know she's you know these are these were small films that the french government you know it's part cnc and stuff but the following and supporting her and stuff is is what allows you know lesbian filmmakers to then make more lesbian content you know more power more power to say what you want absolutely i mean in the subject of short films um, madeline's film character transference is her short <laughs> it's one of the most Brilliant short films I've ever seen. I, I, I was talking to her about it recently because we're we're going to do a sofa club with her eventually, and we're going to show the whole film before we do the um, interview with her. Oh but great! It's a, but it's it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful. And that film Weirdest was shot by uh, Alison Kelly, who is shot Vagina Wolf. The the cinematographer of Conor Farren shot Vagina Wolf and has shot most of Guinevere's shorts as well. Ah, oh, fantastic! I had a really this side note. When I saw Counter Transference, it was at a at a Outfest, you know, the LGBT festival here in LA, and um, you know, the therapist, you just see her legs and hear her voice, and I'm like, is that me? Like that? <laughs> what it was so surreal. I'm like, that sounds like me. 
how I'm like, did I do that and forget? Uh, it's very, it's very surreal. So uh, for anyone who knows my voice, watch it and, and think like, is that her? It's not me. And then I, I went up to, I saw the actress who was there at the screen and I was like, I, when you hear my voice, do I sound like you to you? And she was like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I are you harassing that. me, security? Um, it was just very uh, Another uh, filmmaker, uh, Heather Axe, that she, she just started a collective. Uh, she's done stuff with Silas Howard. Heather, uh, it's called like, Queer Femme Collective. It's out of Oakland. No, it's called Femme Power Productions, and her um, her last name is spelled A C S. Yes, uh, I just, just so in case people want to look her up, Heather yeah. X. A C S, and uh, and and she's doing a lot of interesting stuff. Very collaborative, and then she started like this whole you know collective, and and so I'm seeing, I'm actually feeling like uh, there's a resurgence again, where I feel like these last few years, it it was you know kind of going down production I don't know you know how it is in England but um but you know because it's just really hard finding money is hard crowdfunding is hard and then producing the then making the film and then finishing the film you know Vagina Wolf was a whole adventure uh we were talking earlier about how how did it get made it was like we crowdfunded you know twenty eight thousand dollars and then you know a lot of people volunteered and then a French producer that produced a short film that I made uh, called the turkey uh, he came in and he brought a little bit of money and then I, I bartered I stole I lived in a garage for another year and you know drinking two dollar wine and 40 cent cigarettes you know and then finally we got like the post-production money in France and I went to France and we it, it, you know it was like a almost two year process yeah. to from start to finish and uh, so it's always you know it's hard, it's 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 a, it's passion. They don't call them passion projects for nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, so that's what you need for your first film, most definitely. Um, so, so going back to Vagina Wolf, um, when at what point did you decide on the title "Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf" and and, and why? This was a running joke with Guinevere when we lived together, which I think was from 2009 2010, so like a year or two before. We had, uh, I love spoofs, I love satires, and I love films, and if I, when I become independently wealthy, I would just make lots of little, you know, satires and spoofs. So that was the, first I love, love, love the movie, I love the play, I love the, the drama and the things of people just kind of delusional and reaching a point in their life where they're like, what, like, what happened, you know? But, uh, so the play on words was Who's Afraid of Vagina Wolf? And we wanted to do next, uh, what never happened to baby Jane. And so that we would play, we would both play Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. Well, we thought about who, who would be Betty and who would be Joan. And then we thought, actually, we'll just, in the middle of the movie, we'll switch roles. Yeah. The two you actors should are that. arguing. You should really make that. Oh, my word. That'd be so fun. <laughs> we got we to gotta crowdfund it. <laughs> But um, is it not so obvious that I'm Joan Crawford and she's Betty Davis? <laughs> I am very, I could be both. <clears throat> That's the thing. I'm like, I we all have a little show. baby Jane in us, though, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Mother. But uh, yeah, so it was, you know, it came from like the play on words. And then I started thinking about it. And like, I love the title and I love the, the play. And then I was kind of like taking stock in my life, you know, like, the film is like, you know, her three wish, you know, make a movie, get a girlfriend, lose 20 pounds or, you know, and, you know, I was thinking about it before this today. I was like, I kind of am still like, I still need to want to make a movie, get a girlfriend and lose 20 pounds. I mean, uh, do you remember we were at some film festival with Vagina Wolf back in the day and you turned to me and you were like, I can't believe that I made this film and here I am and I still don't have a girlfriend. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, are we living the movie right now? Like, that's literally a conversation our characters have in the movie. I was like, it's happening. What's, oh my God. <laughs> art imitating uh, life, imitating art, imitating life. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I must quickly ask, who was like, your gorgeous friend just then? Oh, that was my gorgeous little baby Marbles, but she was too sleepy to hang out. Uh, that is my dog, Marbles. I rescued her about a year and a half ago. Oh, lovely. She's a mother. Um, um, okay. <laughs> Another question from, from the audience. Um, uh, this is from Bethany. 
and um, they want to know what is the craziest thing you've done to impress a potential future love interest. Making a film is pretty. Make the whole movie. <laughs> I think with what you just said. Make the whole movie. <laughs> I mean, I think when you heard, I, I, I won't, I can never tell the story, but, uh, but, you know, make the movie, but, you know, I feel like um, there's, I think artists, uh, or I, I'll speak for myself, but I, I'm very motivated also by other artists who just create a lot for love or like the aspiration of love. And I think that, that there's such a fear of showing who you are in life in general that, making a, a piece of you know I, i'm not the best actress you know and uh but i i enjoyed it and and i'm happy with myself i i, I wouldn't fire myself uh for the job i did but you know there's something about like uh being able to tell your story present yourself and then and then see i i, I traveled for 13 months with vagina wolf around the world from tokyo poland all over europe all over france all over the united states Oslo. Uh, Oslo in Norway, like it was really fantastic, and I sat, I sat in the audience 51 times. Oh my word! Yeah, and to see, like, you know, does the Japanese audience get the sense? You know, I wanted to see the sense of humor, but always also to be there for the question and answer with the audience afterwards. Do you and, do you do you literally sit through your film 51 times? Yes. The whole thing. See, wow, that I can't even if I love movies that I do, which I usually do. I, I after a while, it's like a song that's stuck in my head. Like, I'm like, don't get it back in my head. I can't. So I'm amazed that you did that. Yeah, for me, it was really, uh, it, it was a mixture. But one of the main, main reasons was I wanted to, uh, as, a, as a storyteller, what translate, what jokes and what pains and what moments are, are the audience reacting to? Like the first, the first, you know, 10 or 12 times was in the United States. But then I had like a, like three or four months, like just in France and Europe. And then I, then abroad really abroad like japan and, and norway and poland different cultures so i wanted to see like how it would play out uh but you know what's incredible is that i'm still understanding things i, I would i would have moments and i would just be like oh my god like and even now with hindsight and time i'm still it, it's interesting to do work inspired by your life because you the main, another main reason to do it was like, I want to try and understand it. If I can three dimensionalize my situation, it might become more tangible and I, and I could exteriorize it for me and see it with some, you know, distance and understand it, you know? So, um, another motivator to, you know, tell your, your story, like, you know, we're all diverse people and that we need more of our stories, you know, and it's good therapy. Absolutely. Good <laughs> Do you concur or do you have some other thoughts along those lines? Wasn't the original question the craziest thing one has done, what one has done to attract a lover? Yeah. Um, I got very lost in thinking of all the, the um, things I've done, but mostly just amusing myself with the fact that basically everything I do is to attract a lover. <laughs> I just want to look cool and be productive and do cool stuff so people think I'm sexy. <laughs> I'm like, I think of it, my whole life is really just like, aren't I amazing? <laughs> I love that art as, as you know, a girlfriend trapping. <laughs> yeah. I'm single, by the way, so it's not working. Oh, <laughs> but well, how? This for isn't a question, but it's, um, it's more of a statement from Jose, who says um, that you're, you're both icons across the board. Oh, single icon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Are we just difficult? Is that it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we'll have to. We'll have to. Maybe some audience members can tell us. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> um. So um, this is a question from Rowan. One of her original questions, and it's Anna. You've spoken before about the gap between generations in the lesbian community the lack of passing down or sharing cultures. Is lesbian film something that can change? Can change that, do you think? Yes, uh, and, and what she means, and that, 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 that thought is, you know, when I came out when I w in the late 80s, and you know, and then the 90s, it, in my opinion, was like the heyday of like the new generation of lesbians and feminism and LGBT and, you know, in a big way, I think the AIDS uh, crisis and the AIDS virus made everyone come out of the closet. 
uh, or wanted to and or a lot of people like took there was a lot more less hiding and more living and 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 being and i feel like uh when i was started going out to like lesbian bars and book readings and you know herbal tea afternoons we you wanted to you you learned as much as possible about lesbian culture and writers and authors and everybody knew the well of loneliness and people knew you know a personal best and desert hearts and the and the 50s parisian lesbian scene and and that you know like and and about feminism and like you it was very much like um a a, a conversational discussion intellectual elements in the lesbian world like it wasn't necessarily the hottest girl physically the most beautiful quote unquote woman was the most popular it was like your intellect and your convictions and your politics and stuff in the 90s was very important to you know your identity and your collaboration but i would say that then you know as things got better and bigger and then in the 2000s i i, I my theory is that the l word which was was amazing to have it was it, it just thousands of thousands of women all over the world came out because of the L word like like it struck a chord or seeing it the sexiness the funness the different characters whatever but like it was just kind of like oh there's now thousands thousands more women uh, uh out being lesbians but there was started to be not a lot of interest in the rite of passage that was before which was supporting lesbian culture going supporting lesbian businesses reading sometimes reading through lesbian books that you just have to read through you know i i don't want to make any correlation to the books i'm going to say but like there's a lot of you know books that we read like the wall of loneliness or ruby fruit jungle or um or uh boys blues what's the um, stone butch blues. blues uh you know and we sit through a lot of lesbian films and stuff like that that and so i feel like all that part and in general i feel like the 2000s was kind of like a big time where people a lot of lesbians were like or women who love women were saying i'm a woman who loves women or i'm gay but like the word lesbian is still struggling as uh you know as a as an identity to that that you know we ha- like queer has surpassed it and it's great because there's a lot of things that mean queer and i think queer actually means a lot of different things in different contexts there's the queer studies in universities there's queer sexually there's queer presenting and and etc but i feel like film and especially documentary docu fictions like maybe it's not a coincidence that lesbian filmmakers today have made period piece films to kind of get us back to like we were there and that's how it w- there was and there's a lot more than just today's sexy technological you know abundance of like you know there's a thousand way, ways to meet other women today from your room where before you had to like walk in front of the lesbian bar five times and and try to see you know and get courage and go to groups and join groups that maybe you didn't even care about but there was all this stuff in the lesbian culture that you did and then you would meet friends and then you were like we're never going back to that group meeting again but So I feel like uh and I'm very interested in uh, I'm actually trying to with Canada Plus in France I had pitched them this idea you know 10 years ago uh like there's no like comprehensive documentary about the lesbian the the this new wave from 1988 the 90s of lesbians there was also third wave feminism and then you have like the electro clash and peaches and latigra and you know bikini kill and L7 so there's like music and then go fish and the watermelon woman and you know and 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 then the the woman that was in go fish now she's doing american psycho you know it was like all Katie Lang was shaved by uh, you know Cindy Crawford on front of GQ magazine uh Christian Dior started doing campaigns and Calvin Klein of like lesbian chic or uh, you know unisexual um, you know ambiguous uh, you know thing the 90s George Michael came out huge was a huge deal you know freedom 90 so there's all these different things madonna talked about the cubby hole on the david letterman show which is a nighttime talk show with sandra bernhard everybody was like oh my god like there was no inter- there, nobody you know so it was all these like kind of important injections into the mainstream and it seemed like everybody was you know madonna made out with britney and christina you know uh <laughs> so i feel like like you know and then there's so many so, like we were talking about lesbian filmmakers there's so many like lesbian filmmakers just from these last 10 20 years 
that you know we don't talk about like I you keep looking at top 20 fil lesbian films or top 10 of the 20th century the 21st century it's often 80 percent the same films and it's still like go fish like and rightly so but it's like there's 15 20 years of filmmaking right now what are those films mm. you know who, who are these why don't we know them as well well we're not promoting it and talking about it in our culture the bars have disappeared the bookstores have disappeared the websites have disappeared or changed you know we had a lot more lesbian focused websites that had great journalists uh you know and and we're talking and interviewing and spreading you know the gospel no, that's so true. so i feel like you know definitely like documentaries and like docufictions uh you know we we're, we've revisited the 70s a million times we revisited the 80s dance you know like pop culture dance culture even now we're having more and more films about gay men lives in the 70s 80s 90s and act up and the, you know the party places we need we need that for lesbian and for like women's you know women's stories yeah. you know no thank you um, we're, we're we're kind of getting to, towards the end of the uh, of our time, I'm afraid. But um, um, it's perhaps the, the the perfect point to ask you about um, what you're up to now. Where are you? Well, together we're doing this teen serial killer uh, movie. I'm uh, I'm doing a, a massive rewrite on the script, and Anna's directing, and we're hoping to be shooting August. Yeah, really. It's just about me hurrying up and no pressure uh, fixing the script, so it's ready to shoot. Uh, I also have a, the, a project I was talking about earlier um, that I wrote uh, to, for myself to play, and we, uh, the director and I, wrote it uh, intentionally, making it very uh, COVID friendly to shoot because it's only five characters and it's one location. Weirdly, budget and COVID, low budget and COVID, go well together. We not only not only because you know fewer people fewer locations is you know is less expensive but um you know as independent filmmakers we're so used to working around stuff and making figuring out how to make stuff work that we're all sort of better equipped to to make films in this time because we're just we're used to you know working with what we got so i have that uh, and uh this project with anna called claire at 16 and trying to raise money to uh, the make the next movie that I wrote with Mary Heron, which will be our fourth collaboration. You'd think people would just hand us money by now, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> they do not. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> Every time it's a struggle, we're like, can you see that when we, when you let us, when you give us money, we make good movies. <laughs> um, and um, I am, I've been working hard uh, before quarantine, uh, pitching a television show uh, that is not lesbian, um, but is, is very um, sort of queer in other ways. Anna? Yeah. So yeah, uh, I, I just wanted a quick anecdote. Claire 16 um, was written originally by a man and was going to be directed by a man. And the lead actress who's uh, in Riverdale, if you guys are fans of Riverdale, uh, Madeline Pesh, who plays Cheryl Blossom, and she, be she became an EP on it. And she said, this has to be directed by a woman and this script has to be revisited by a, a, a female screen screenwriter. And she caused that change. And, you know, I was one of six directors that came in. I finally got the job. I brought Guinevere. They were like, yes, yes. And so that's a good thing because, you know, even though this is a small independent film uh, and it's, uh, I, I, I pitched it as a neo-feminist, like a 21st century neo-feminist noir black comedy. And it's a very empowerment. And as Guinevere says, wish fulfillment film for uh, women and girls. Uh, but... Um, so I'm doing that, and that's a, a good sign because I absolutely want to have more access to mainstream money and productions and for more projects. Uh, then I'm working, I'm pitching this idea. It's I'm calling it with a tongue-in-cheek the lipstick lesbian revolution from lesbian culture from 19 like the popification of lesbian culture from 1998 to 2010, and it's following everything I've just said. And then I have my dream project, which is called The Rise and Fall of Gertrude Frankenstein. Set in Paris, <laughs> it's like Moulin Rouge meets Rocky Horror Picture Show. <clears throat> Gertrude Stein comes back from the dead and she is pissed because the world has become all about entertainment. And her life was all about culture and activism and, you know, art. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking for 
money, somebody who knows how to do musicals, write musicals, write songs, but I have like a lot of the stuff for it. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm meeting a lot of people uh, thanks to Madeline's film and we got nominated for a Spirit Award, Wild Night with Emily. I met a lot of people in the industry. There's a lot more LGBT people in the industry. There's a lot more Latinos and diverse cultures. Um, and, uh, and I have a feature film actually that Issa Rae, uh, she has her own show on HBO and her own uh, production company uh, called The Papaya Factory that were also uh, in the final like rewrites. And that's, it's my 15 year old in Miami in the 80s story. So I'm working hard to get more stuff out there. You've both got amazing projects on the on the go. It's 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 really it's really rewarding to to know that, it, that they're happening. Well, mm -hmm. they're they're waiting to happen. And, yes, uh, um, it's exciting. You know. The future looks bright for for what once we can figure out how to actually shoot things. Uh, lots <laughs> will be lots will happen. <laughs> yeah, exciting times ahead. So I'd like to thank you both ever so much for. For sharing your time with us tonight. Thank um, you. When we finish, I didn't say this to you earlier. Please hang on. Don't don't go away. Okay. <laughs> don't jump in the pool. Finish, um, because this, you'll see. Anyway, okay. but um, Anna and Guinevere, thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for spending your time with us as well. Um, next week's um, Sofa Club is. A little bit special in that it's a it's not going to be live it's going to be a pre-recorded um conversation around the themes of um are you proud um and then the following week there'll be a um a live uh server club with um leon lopez from soft lab but um once again um guinevere and anna thank you ever so much thank you thank you, thank you everyone thanks for watching oh, thank you for watching Watch Hooters with uh, owls on Peccadillo. Uh, it is worth it. Both of them. You gotta watch it. It's a lot of me being pissed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really funny documentary. It's a gorgeous documentary. Really gorgeous documentary.